Hi guys, Dan and James here. Uh, welcome back for I Measure You Research Review number seven. Uh, it's James' turn today, and I think James has his presentation all set for us. So, James, what have you been reading this week? So, this week is quite an interesting paper, um, and I'll get into why I chose it, but let's start with what the paper is. So it's a joint kinetic analysis of rugby place kicking technique to understand why kickers achieve different performance outcomes. The authors were Alex Atak, Grant Chiwata, and Neil Bezodis. So once again, I do apologize if I butchered anyone's names there. I'm happy to take any advice on how to pronounce it if I've pronounced it incorrectly. So I do apologize to any of the authors. Cool. So if you want to kind of run through your your review mate and tell us a little bit more initially um about what the researchers were were looking into and what the objectives of the paper were cool so well to start off let's start with why i looked at that paper so one of the reasons is it, rugby place kicking is under looked at that as the authors allude to in their paper that when you look at golf when you look at cricket even and football you know, the types of techniques used and, you know, the kicking techniques used is highly analyzed. I'll never forget a yep. quote um, by Didier Drogba, actually. He, he treated himself as a golf player at times and he would just try different methods of kicking, you know, so different angles, so foot angles, steepness, shallow, you know, just trying different methods. And the same can obviously go for rugby. So a lot's been done in cricket like that. A lot's been done in golf, obviously as we know, and then, so it just was interesting to see that this is the type of research happening in rugby now as well. So, cool. if we just jump ahead to the objectives and rationale, so let's just start with quickly the objectives. So, basically, as the author state, they wanted to identify the differences in kicking leg and torso mechanics between groups of rugby place kickers who achieve different performance outcomes. Outcomes, sorry, and to understand why these features are associated with varying levels of success. So basically trying to figure out, you know, what might potentially be the most successful um, technique. And the rationale, so you'll see two random numbers just pop up in my bubble there. But basically, essentially, this is approximately 45% of points scored in international rugby union are from place kicking. So that's a large percentage. And some research has shown that there is, if you had to switch the kicker's stats, the result will switch to the other team in 14% of the occasions, if that makes sense. So, I mean, that's not some arbitrary number. That's just directly comparing them one for one. And, yep. I mean, if you're looking for 1% differences, you've got, you know, this is much larger in elite sports. Um, so, yeah, that, that was one of the reasons why I chose it because it's, uh, it's definitely underlooked at, and it's such an important part of the game. No, I, com I completely agree. So, tell us how they did it and what what the what the um, research looked like. Cool. So let's take a look at the me methodology. So I'm going to just skim through this because, but with this section, I highly, highly recommend you read the paper purely because it it does get um, quite in depth, and it's something that if you are really interested in this research, you would need to read. But essentially, they took 33 male rugby place kickers, and they vary from amateur to international level. So when we look at limitations, this might be one of them, um, just because of the varying levels. So varying ages, varying sizes, but th they were all experienced place kickers with the lowest level being a first team university player. So that was the participants, and then their protocol. So each player essentially got five kicks. It was done indoors. And they were told to basically kick at their maximum range. So kick as far as they could. They got to choose their preferred kicking tee. And they kicked at a vertical target suspended in a net, which obviously acted as the goalpost, which they had to kick towards. Okay. Yep. Cool. So oh, the, just what was used. So obviously they used some really good systems. They used the Vicon MX3 system and a Kessler Force platform. So they're not shy on that. And basically what they did is the data was then inputted into a model, which ATAC developed in 2018 to basically simulate or model the ball flight, the path of the ball, yep. obviously post the net. And one kick was taken, essentially, it was the kicker's greatest maximum kick. So, yeah, 33 participants, 
and out of their five kicks, they used one. And okay, cool. So let's look at their data collection. So basically, what they wanted to find was 3D kinematics and ground reaction force. Pelvis and thorax orientations were calculated, which was used, calculated by the global z-axis, and rotation of the thorax relative to the pelvis using the XYZ card and rotation sequence was used. So, and that is, I wanted to highlight that because that to me is, from their findings, one of the most interesting pieces out of all of this. So, what they did is kickers were grouped. So, the 32 meters is basically, they were grouped in either long, wide left, or short. And long, you were grouped long if you kicked it over the post and it was over 32 meters. And short was anyone short of 32 meters. Wide left was people with uh, individuals or participants that got the distance but missed the goalpost to the left. And wide right were those that missed it to the right. However, subsequently, the wide right was eliminated because there was only one of them and they didn't believe that that was obviously enough to make inferences on. And the statistics they use, they use magnitude-based inferences using uh, the smallest important effect size of 0 0.2, as it's described by um, Hopkins and Batam, I believe it is. They also used 1D statistical parametric mapping with an alpha of 5%. So, I mean, that's all the boring stuff, and I wanted to flow through that pretty quickly. But I, I do want to stress that that is really important. They really go, they explain their methods and their data analysis quite in depth. Yeah, it's always a challenge in these presentations to to kind of represent the the methodology um, to a, the greatest extent. So yeah, I highly recommend anybody watching this does read the read the full paper too. So James, if we want to go into what they found. Yeah, so let's take a look at results and discussion. I've, I've grouped them together just purely for time perspective for us so we, we don't sit here all day because I found some of this research highly fascinating. And I've basically grouped them in their findings from the three groups, so long, wide left, and short respectively, as well as just a little final bit on the tables um, and figures. So the long kickers, so what did they find with the long kickers? They found that they had more positive knee extensor work as well as negative knee flexor work when compared to both other groups. So essentially, basically, they kicked with more force. They had less positive hip flexor work than the wide left, but more than short. So to dive into that a bit, that obviously, I, you need a lot more data to confirm this. But basically, what this would say is that you need hip flexor work, but there's, there's also a limit where its benefits end. So you, know, you can't just um, have high hip flexor work and be a good goal kicker. Uh, greater pelvic retraction than short at the top of the backswing. So basically, once again, looking at angles of thorax and pelvis, which we'll get into in a bit more detail in a bit. And the thorax orientation, thorax orientation was more towards the kicking side in 70% um, of the downswing versus the wide left and 100% versus the short. So the wide left kickers were slight, their thorax was orientated more towards the kicking side for 30% to the long kickers, if that makes sense. But the long kickers were always had a, had a thorax which was orientated more towards the kicking side, so their dominant side, um, 100% of the down and back swing, if, if that makes sense. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's just interesting. So, short kickers, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on, but basically, they were found to be more front on. They had lower ball and kicking foot velocities, which you would expect, but long and wide left kickers had equal uh, kicking foot velocities and ball velocities. So that, that is pretty basic, um, basic physics. Higher, you know, higher ball and kicking foot velocities, the further the ball's gonna go, pretty much. So if we then take a look at wide left, they were also more front on compared to long. So we, try, we paint in a picture that less front on is better. It improves accuracy as well as distance. They were more hip dominant compared to the long kickers, which is interesting. And they believe this increased longitudinal ball spin. And they do go into it a bit in their discussion. But basically, if you liken it to golf, it almost seems like the angle of attack is different. 
in terms of they almost go what golfers call over the top. And so essentially what's probably pulling that ball a bit right. I mean, left, sorry. So that's, what, that's you know, if you want to liken it a bit to golf and just see, you know, how you can compare it. But wide left had a large tension arc, which is also known as, I believe, the X factor in golf, which, which a golf and golf is likened to the coil, the coil mechanism. So a large pelvic says thorax angle, which basically creates stored energy to basically be able to kick it further. But at the cost potentially of direction, if that makes sense. So once again, attention arc is good, but with regards to rugby place kicking specifically, there is a limit. You lose direction you know, at a certain point. Where that point is, we're not too sure. But I mean, this is just initial research and it, it's just fascinating to note. And this table, I wanted to just highlight a couple of points because we see it's quite um, comprehensive. But I want to highlight the two bits I've underlined there. So if you look at the top one, longitudinal spin, Look at long was 288 plus minus 206. We're wide left was 746 plus 466. That's per second, obviously. And that's fascinating. You can see there's a huge difference. And that is potentially due to that, um, that angle of attack or direction of attack and adding to that longitudinal spin, which you would obviously expect you'd have less control of the ball then and why you potentially miss. And if we look at something that they didn't really allude to, and I know it's not, there's not huge differences here, and it's the short has the lowest vertical velocity, but I do like how they do make mention of the vertical velocity, because we know, especially in sports like cricket, uh, when you're bowling, you, you, you want to use as much energy directed towards the target and not going up, running, bowling, anything like that. You really want as much energy as possible forward and not up. So yeah, all in all, it was just fascinating research um, to see all of that and the little quirks of the different kickers. But to talk to the limitations, I think the cohort they used was a little bit spread potentially. Um, but yep. we all know the difficulties of getting participants for a study like this to try to get 50 international rugby players. Good luck. Um, yep. So once again, I, I don't think they could have really avoided that. It was done indoors, and I know they are potentially looking at doing some outdoor studies um, similar. And I, I would recommend that purely because, once again, your ecological validity there is not there, which I do note. Um, but once again, they did use the gold stand, the lab-based gold standards. So it, it would be fascinating to see when you add a bit of position of the field to these kicks as well, and not just kick into a net as well as a bit of pressure, uh, their boots. They, they use this different kicking tees, which could be a yeah. confounding variable to me because they're all different heights. So your angle of attack is naturally going to be different. And they, they just mentioned some fascinating points in there when they talk about launch angles and comparing it to football. So I do highly recommend you read that paper outside of our little snapshot here. No, that's great, mate. That's fairly comprehensive comprehensive review to what sounds like a, a pretty complex paper in itself so um no good work is there anything else that you wanted to add no i don't think so i just think that that i i enjoy that theme of the rugby place kick in purely because it's you know all the research is going towards football etc etc and to look at research like this i think it's not easy for a researcher purely because you know the cohorts are naturally going to be quite slim to try to get enough participants. And also it's just a big risk for a researcher to go into unknown territory. And I, I quite enjoy that. So I, I think to be fair, kudos to the researchers. I really enjoyed the paper, especially some of their findings, which was, I'd like to see more research and even a similar study just built up with making it ecologically valid with similar parameters to see, you know, what, what differentiates the best in the world from the good. Nice. No, good work. Okay, well, that brings our seventh research review to a close. So thank you, Shane, for your review. Uh, as always, the paper will be, we will share the paper, sorry, um, when, we, when we share the presentation. So 
please do give it a read. And of course, as always, let us know your thoughts on um, the presentation itself. Uh, thank you for watching. Have a good weekend and we will see you next week. Cool. Cheers, guys.